Uh, my name is Sara Saberi. I am the co-director of the Inherited Cardiomyopathy Program at the University of Michigan here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So many unmet needs, but I think if we're going to just focus on patients that have obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, first, the medications that are considered standard of care, like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, disopyramide, have never undergone robust clinical trials to show that they can actually improve how people feel in their own words, how they feel, as opposed to, you know, a physician's assessment of how a patient feels. Both are important and they're not the same. Second is that even though we know those medications are effective at reducing the degree of outflow obstruction, they're not perfect and that they have side effects that can actually um, mimic some of the symptoms that people have related to obstructive HCM. Third, um, when those medications are ineffective at improving symptom burden, then what we're left with are invasive procedures like surgical myectomy and alcohol septal ablation to manage the outflow obstruction. Now, none of these procedures or medications actually get at the heart of what is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They don't alter the disease um, in any way. They don't go after the underlying pathophysiology. And so um, they're not perfect. You know, of course, no intervention and no medication will be perfect, but those are kind of some of the unmet needs that we currently have for patients with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The parent study is the Redwood HCM study, and that consisted of um, patients that were randomized to either aficantin or placebo. So aficantin is a cardiac, cardiac myosin inhibitor, um, and it reduces the hypercontractility of the myocardium of the heart muscle. So this was a study basically phase two, so meaning um, essentially looking at safety and feasibility. And there were two different cohorts um, that were, uh, they had different dosing schemes. So a lower uh, milligram dosing scheme than a concurrent um, higher milligram dosing scheme, basically to help find what are appropriate doses for the medication. And um, what the finding was, so this was, you know, patients that were on the drug for about 10 weeks. What the findings were, were that those who, um, uh, received aficantin actually were able to tolerate the medication well. There were no major, you know, organ dysfunction, so no kidney failure, liver failure, uh, no big time, you know, strokes and heart attacks and things, you know, cardiovascular effects like that that we would worry about. Um, and that the side effect profile was um, very tolerable, in fact, pretty comparable to side effects that were reported by uh, participants in the trial who were taking placebo. Um, and ultimately, what they also found, even though the study was not powered you know, for efficacy to show that aficantin is actually superior to, to placebo, um, which in this case, it was placebo plus standard of care um, medication therapy. So basically looking really at standard of care versus aficantin, it wasn't powered to show that it was more effective than standard of care plus placebo, but we did see a pretty dramatic improvement in the degree of outflow obstruction and then um, with a concurrent very small decline in left ventricular systolic function or the as measured by ejection fraction. So it really took um, the ejection fractions from a super normal place to a more normal range. Um, and there are also concomitant improvements in markers of myocardial strain. So NT pro BNP and high sensitivity to so uh, the participants in, the, in those um, first couple of cohorts in the Redwood study had the opportunity then to move into the open label long-term extension study, so Redwood OLE, and um, where everybody is treated with aficantin, so there's no more placebo. And um, the dose of aficantin is titrated based on echocardiographic parameters that are site interpreted. So basically trying to mimic what would happen in the real world where a patient comes to the office, is assessed by echo, symptom inventory, and then a decision is made about what medications should be chosen and at what doses. 
Um, so the dose of abicantin was selected and up titrated really based on ejection fraction and the degree of dynamic obstruction. So the burden of obstruction with uh, Valsalva. Uh, the doses that were available for titration were 5, 10, 15, and 20 milligrams. So actually, at the time of this particular study analysis, the majority of the participants had not been um, eligible for the 20 milligram dose because that dose had not yet been approved um, as um, we were waiting for data from the, you know, the parent study to inform whether or not that would be a dose that would be um, available. So participants came in uh, for a screening evaluation that included echocardiogram, uh, physical exam, lab, um, and uh, as well as cardiac MRI and underwent uh, patient reported outcome surveys. So primarily the KCCQ or the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. Um, and then this uh, questionnaire was administered every 12 weeks or every three months uh, throughout the time that participants were on protocol. The um, drug dose is really ramped up within the first six weeks and then stays steady unless we see evidence of um, significant outflow obstruction on follow-up echoes. So it's really patients are here every couple of weeks for six weeks, and then they're here every three months for evaluation thereafter. And the particular analysis that we're focusing on is the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire uh, data. So we have data now on about 42 participants who have completed through um, weeks 12 and 24. Um, so we have baseline week 12 and week 24, cases Q data. The Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire is a 23 item uh, cardiomyopathy specific questionnaire that's assessing how people feel. And it really consists of four domains. So uh, symptom burden, physical function, social function, and quality of life. And then there's two summary scores. One is the overall summary score that takes into account all those four domains. And then the clinical summary score which really uh, focuses on symptom burden and uh, physical functioning. The range of scores is zero to 100 with 100 you know, higher numbers basically being better, meaning and, um, fewer, less symptom burden, better overall uh, functional capacity, better quality of life. And what are considered um, you know, significant changes in KCCQ, uh, the minimum is five uh, point change. It's considered kind of a minimum clinically significant change with a five point change being a small change, a 10 point being moderate to large, and then a 20 point change or higher being a large to very large change. And so we are, you know, looking at the data um, of the KCCQ through this study. So uh, like I said, it's 42 participants. On average, they've completed about 33 weeks of uh, the um, uh, open label uh, study. Mean age is 59 and 60% of the participants are women. They're fairly symptomatic, uh, split evenly between your heart association class two and class three symptom burden. They're on background medical therapy with about three fourths on beta blockers and the rest on calcium channel blockers and disulfiramide. They are, you know, true to form are, are in terms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy pathophysiology, they're hyperdynamic. So the mean ejection fraction is 69%. Um, and they have significant outflow obstruction. So the mean resting gradient is about 50 millimeters of mercury and with Valsalva about 80 millimeters of mercury. They have evidence of myocardial strain related to their uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with elevated nt pro in the 640 range. Uh, high sensitivity to troponin was about 15. Um, so they're, I think, a pretty representative group of um, patients with uh, obstructive HCM. Well, really the take home is that uh, the KCCQ improvements seen with Afikansin are pretty incredible. There was substantial and significant positive impact on patient reported health status noted in every single KCCQ domain. Um, and that was seen at the three months, 12 week uh, time point and sustained through the uh, six month time point. Really, we saw about uh, 62 to 72% of uh, participants had at least a five point improvement in um, their KCCQ scores through this time period, uh, with the vast majority experiencing um, uh, significantly more, you know, higher 
um, improvements in terms of moderate to large or large to very large improvements um, with you know, a small chunk, about 25%, who experience either no change or a, a detriment in terms of um, their symptom burden and their health status overall. This was concomitant with an improvement in the degree of alpha obstruction. So by about four weeks of treatment, we see um, complete resolution of resting obstruction and um, significant improvements in the degree of Valsalva obstruction um, below the um, range where we would even still define somebody as having obstructive uh, form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Ejection fraction was overall preserved. So um, we didn't, the, the mean ejection fraction came down to about 64%, which is well within normal limits. And these symptoms, you know, um, at least the health status um, assessment were corroborated by the symptom burden and functional capacity um, uh, overall status as the site investigators were assessing them with New York Heart Association class. So where to begin with, um, remember I said that at baseline, about half of uh, the participants were in the New York Heart Association class three category by about 12 weeks. Um, uh, about 8% were in the New York Heart Association class three category, and, and that was sustained at six months with now about 40% reporting New York Heart Association class one symptoms where we had nobody reporting New York Heart Association class one symptoms to begin with. Um, roughly 80% of the participants experienced at least a one class improvement in New York Heart Association class. And we also see that there's a significant um, improvement in the amount of myocardial strain. So there was a 70% reduction from baseline um, in the NT pro BMP at week 12 and 24, and then about a 30% reduction in the high sensitivity troponin relative to baseline in that same time frame. Um, and then in terms of safety, which you know, of course we're all interested in, um, the drug was really well tolerated. There were no early terminations. There was no drug withdrawal. There were two um, participants who had either a dose um, reduction or a dose interruption. The dose reduction in one participant was due to uh, what was thought to be QTC prolongation and kind of a conduction abnormality on EKG, but it was actually overcorrected um, by the core lab and that had been an error. So that person returned to their uh, baseline at the Campton dose. The other participant had a mild reduction in their LV systolic function with an ejection fraction of 47% in the setting of a bout of atrial fibrillation um, that was protracted and required um, antiarrhythmic medications in order to get under control. And, and then once the ejection fraction normalized after getting the, the um, atrial fibrillation under control, that patient also went back on Afghanistan and, and both um, actually had done really quite well thereafter. So this is a long-term extension study. You know, we're hoping that um, this, the trial um, protocol is that it would last about five years. And so we will see you know, many more patients enter into this, um, this open label extension study. Um, right now it's the patients that were in the parent study for Redwood that are participating, but as the Sequoia HCM, which is the phase three clinical trial comparing Afikampton to placebo, really looking at efficacy, as that trial gets underway and participants finish that protocol, then they'll also have an opportunity to enroll in the long-term extension study. So we anticipate you know, hundreds of patients that will um, be eligible to participate in this longer-term study. And so it'll be good to see, you know, these are three time points essentially that KCCQ had been looked at. And so, you know, the, there's a lot of other variables that go into how people feel about their health status on a particular day. And so it'll be important to see is this data reproducible in a much larger population of patients with obstructive HCM? And also, is it sustained you know, in the longer haul? Um, and is this a medication that not just you know, is able to make numbers look better, but can it actually make patients feel better um, and feel um, a relief of the burden of symptoms and functional limitations that they feel related to their HCM in the long haul?
other next steps really, and we're all looking forward to um, the cardiac MRI data that will be obtained um, through the duration of this study to take a look at structural changes um, of the heart over time um, with aficantin um, therapy. So that data won't be in for quite some time yet, but uh, one that's highly anticipated. Thank you.